Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for, for being with us. Thanks, above all, to the panel members to, to take the time and, and, and share their perspectives on us. We have a theme which is really connection and communication in Africa. And we have with us, I'll quickly go over some of the highlights in their CVs. You, you have the more detailed versions. We have Jay Ireland, who was appointed president and CEO of GE Africa in 2011. Since his, his appointment, Jay has overseen the growth of General Electric Africa to a footprint of over 1,800 employees and revenues of over 2.4 billion with businesses across aviation, power generation, oil and gas, healthcare, and rail transportation. Uh, Jay is also the vice chairman of the Corporate Council of Africa, a member of the board of directors of Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation, and a trustee of St. Lawrence University. Jay, thanks a lot for, for being with us. Um, then we have Bob Collimore. Robert Collimore is the CEO of Safaricom Limited, a leading communications company in Africa and pioneer of M-Pesa, the world's most developed mobile payment system. Bob has more than 30 years of commercial experience working in the telecom sector, and he's passionate about how businesses can be catalysts in transforming communities and, and whole countries. The United Nations Secretary General appointed Bob to the United Nations Global Compact Board. Then we have um, Fernando de Sousa, General Manager, Africa Initiatives for Microsoft. Fernando is the General Manager for Microsoft Africa Initiative. He has 30 years of experience in ICT across four continents, having first joined Microsoft in 1992 as a technical manager in South Africa. Since that time, he has held many <coughs> positions with the company, including serving as Chief Operating Officer for Microsoft Saudi Arabia, as well as Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Middle East and North Africa, based in Istanbul, which is my home city, so I'm... <laughs> uh, uh, Fernando is from Mozambique, and he was once a race car driver. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that towards the end. <laughs> Misspent youth. <laughs> and finally, we have Strive Masiiva, Chairman and Founder of Econet Wireless. Strive is the chairman and founder of Econet Wireless, a diversified telecom group with operations and investments in Africa, Europe, North America, Latin America, and the Asia Pacific. Um, Masiwa currently co-chairs the African Union World Economic Forum platform for investment in African agriculture, known as Grow Africa and recently took over the chairmanship of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa from uh, former Secretary General Kofi Annan. As a philanthropist, he and his wife financed the Higher Life Foundation, which provides scholarships to over 42,000 African orphans. So this is a great panel, and again, thank you very much for being with us. I, just a few words, uh, uh, our African Growth Initiative in, in, at Brookings is now uh, almost five years old. We really focus on bringing Africa's voice to Washington and at the same time partnering, partnering with a network of African think tanks and universities throughout Africa. It, for us, this event uh, attached to President Obama's hosting the African summit is extremely exciting and we're trying our best to make it as successful as possible. Um, on the communications team is, is, of course, crucial for Africa. I, I was head of UNDP for a while, but before that, I was uh, at the World Bank some long years ago. And I remember traveling, uh, let's say, from Abidjan to Brazzaville, you know, was, we had to go through Paris, basically. Uh, you still have to go sometimes say, through... You still have to go through somewhere. <laughs> you still have to sometimes go through Paris, London, or now more, more often maybe Dubai. Um, but uh, bringing Africa, this huge continent, together to communicate, to, to interact, in, in, in having the physical infrastructure, which is so important, but also you know, the, the, the kind of softer infrastructure, the whole communication network, where mobile telephony has been such a huge breakthrough technology, is, I think, a huge opportunity, and I think many of us hope that Africa will be leapfrogging some of the old technologies. We already see it happening in banking, in healthcare, and in, in other areas. Um, and finally, human networks. At the end of the day, 
maybe the most important of all networks. Networks of entrepreneurs, of academics, of NGOs, um, civil society, uh, and, and particularly business now looking at Africa as real investment. Philanthropy is great, and I think we obviously we, we want to encourage it as much as possible. But when business sees real profit opportunities and, 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 and an opportunity to develop Africa while being good for its bottom line and while integrating it fully into the business and the value added chains, I think that's when we will see Africa's takeoff becoming sustainable and, and really lasting. So with that, we'll go in the order of seating here and uh, we'll start with Jay. Great, well thanks so much for having me and uh, it's great to be here this week. Um, I actually started last week, we had a trade trade mission with uh, some energy ministers down to uh, Houston for oil and gas. So the, the whole aspect of getting more people understanding Africa uh, and more importantly getting a lot of the African leaders and heads of state and business leaders uh, here to connect is a key thing which is obviously a big theme of the conference. I said earlier as we met uh, in, the, in the other room, I said it's nice to have a metal bender across all these IT guys and telephone guys. So, um, Some hard power. Right. So uh, we're an infrastructure company, GE. Um, I've been in Nairobi, Kenya for the last three and a half years. We wanted to put a real focus on developing markets. So we put uh, senior leaders in, in a number of uh, different regions. And what I've seen in Africa, uh, the growth, obviously, we all know about the the demographics, the population, the growing middle class, et cetera, et cetera. But the real thing that's got to happen is taking those demographics and really getting a, a, a real value out of them. And to do that, the infrastructure has to be improved, not just the physical infrastructure, roads, rails, power, electricity, but also the, uh, the communication infrastructure as well, which I think has leapfrogged in many cases um, here in the U.S. My daughter, who's come and visited us when we were in out in the safari in Kenya said, thank you for Safaricom, that said that we, they had better service there than she did in her apartment in Manhattan. So, Bob, you can <laughs> we'll give you that a commercial. <laughs> um, but, but overall, it's, it's absolutely imperative. I think the innovation uh, aspect in Africa is, is totally undervalued and, and misunderstood by many people uh, when I come back. And I think come back to the U.S. and talk to people. We have tremendous innovation that's occurring. As someone said earlier today in another uh, meeting I was at, you know, typical development, you go th one through six in a sequential manner, and there's no real reason that in Africa we can't go from one, two to six uh, and, and leap over, let's three, three, four, five. And I think we have done that in some, in some industries. A lot of it's capable because of the telecommunication infrastructure and the ability now of, of technology to continue to move um, bigger and bigger pieces of data, if you will, uh, across that. We, we're working on a number of solutions in the healthcare sector in Africa to really drive capability from the rural areas, if you will, back into the urban areas where we do have trained doctors, technicians that can read x-rays or ultrasounds, et cetera. So, uh, we're having that ability to really change the real lives of people um, that are away from, let's say, the, um, you know, the, the centers of where you would see the, the, trained, uh, the trained medical people. The other big area is energy. Uh, energy is obviously the big, or electricity is the big one. Uh, uh, we all know about the electricity deficit in Africa. It's absolutely imperative to correct that. Um, we're happy to help doing that. From a, uh, We have a, a, a whole... Um, plethora of, of products across a number of different uh, power capabilities, but most importantly, it's to give p access. We can generate all the power and, or, or deliver generation to the grid, but you need access to the consumers. And I think, again, when you look at some of the technologies that are out there, uh, not just an, a standpoint of taking the grid and doing some things that, that um, are power by the hour, things like that, rental capability, for people, again, through the telecom uh, uh, lines, but also uh, the ability to bring solar power or very microgrids and things like that, which, again, the payment mechanisms are the key, and that's the access piece, and a lot of that is done with, through, through mobile, mobile telephony. So I think all of those are, are absolutely critical. But, you know, one of the key things that I found 
is that even with all of that, and as you said uh, earlier about traveling around, the, the most important thing that has to happen to change Africa is going to have to be more and more investment. There's a lot of dollars that want to invest in Africa from all over, east, west, uh, you know, developed worlds, developing countries. And that's going to happen because people perceive that the risks match the rewards on an investment basis. And the only way that people are going to understand the true risk perception of Africa, or the risk reality, if you will, of Africa, is to be there. You have to be local. You, you, you know, if I was trying to do my job sitting in London or sitting in, um, in uh, the US uh, and flying in every now and then, I'd have a very hard time to really connect with the people that you need to from a business standpoint, not just in government, but also other business leaders, and to really understand what the issues were. And I think that's a big piece. And I think the more people that come to Africa from a standpoint of investing, then they really realize, yes, there's a lot of challenges. We all know what they are, but they're not insurmountable. It's an easy place to do business. We have grown, or a, a, in, I wouldn't say it's an easy place to do business, but it's easier in some respects than people think, uh, harder in others, quite frankly. But um, you know, we've been able to grow our business from running about a billion a year on orders to about four this year in the last three years. So we've been able to grow it pretty dramatically. And it's all been because we have a focus on the ground. We've continued to hire local people. And that makes, that makes the communication, if you will, and the, th and the theme of the conference is really, or the panel is to really have the communication, not just using the technology, but also using the old you know, meeting and understanding and, and understanding what, can, what has to be done to get things accomplished. Thanks a lot, Jay. And I'll turn mm -hmm. to Bob. And one, one point maybe to all the panelists, you know, there are quite a few studies on catch-up and leapfrogging. And in Asia also, you know, the catching up with the technology has been a big story of growth. But one question mark that now is there and people are asking when looking at the data, they see that technologies are spreading very, very fast. So when they appear somewhere in the world, in, you know, in Japan or in the US or Germany, very few months later or maybe years, some short years later, they are in Africa and in other parts of the developing world. But that's not necessarily true for the, their diffusion inside the country. So any, any remarks on that would, would, would also be very welcome. But Jay already mentioned at least twice the mobile payment system as one of the great examples of leapfrogging. And you're the, one of the greatest leaders of that. Well, I have to check when I get back to make sure that, uh, that Jay actually is one of our customers. <laughs> 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 and his daughter is. You know, one of the problems we've got uh, with much of the, the narrative today and this week is about this thing called Africa. And to a large extent, when we think about Africa, we think about um, you know, the continental size rather than the 55, it's 55 including Morocco, 55 countries that make up the continent. And uh, you know, whilst it's a billion people, those billion people speak between 2,000 and 3,000 languages. Um, different cultures, we have different religions, we have different um, different political makeup. And regional integration, you know, uh, Mo Ibrahim said this morning, uh, and he, he often says it, that integration in Africa, unless we, we can get a grip in it, we will never be able to compete uh, globally. But so, you know, where are we in that integration story? Uh, you know, to move a 40 foot container from Dubai to Mombasa is about $1,400. To move the same container from Mombasa to Kampala is about, is, is approaching $4,000. And it takes a lot longer to get that container from Mombasa up to Kampala than it takes to get from Hong Kong to, um, to Hong Kong to Mombasa. So, I, and, and another one which actually relates much more to our industry: to call Washington from Nairobi is about five U.S. cents, uh, but to call Kampala from Nairobi is about twenty-eight U.S. cents. And so, uh, first word of caution is when you think about this thing called Africa, uh, you know, it is it is not a thing called Africa. It's fifty-five things called, called Africa. The, the second thing around Africa is the youth bulge. You know, is it a threat or is it an opportunity? I mean, typically, uh, we, we talk about unemployment rates sitting at about 20% across the continent. But that betrays the fact that if you take South Africa, it's about 50%. And in, uh, in Nigeria, whereas I think it's about, recorded about 13%, the fact that, Nairo that Nigeria has 170 million people, that's a lot of idle young people without, you know, idle and very energetic young people without, um, without a purpose in life. So, you know, 
uh, Jay and uh, the GE team have been doing a lot of investment in Africa and are doing a lot of stuff around uh, energy. And when we look at investing in Africa, we do tend to look at the more glamorous part. We say, um, you know, in Kenya, we've just discovered oil in Turkana, so let's go throw money into it. The problem with that, uh, whilst, you know, there's absolutely a need for, for energy because only 80% of the population are currently having access to, um, to electricity and, you know, you can't industrialize a country unless you have power. The problem with that is it doesn't, um, it doesn't create jobs. You know, it's capital intensive. Mm -hmm. And again, if I come back to Turkana, uh, we, we cannot get very excited about it. But the problem with that is that the jobs which will be created will be for hotel porters and for drivers. There will be no quality jobs. And so that doesn't then address the issue of, um, of youth unemployment, which I think across the continent, in all of the countries, it, it is a problem. I want to talk a little bit about the role of agriculture, because agriculture, again, across the continent, typically it's about 20% uh, contribution to GDP. And it's higher and lower in some places. Um, but, and it's about 50% of, of exports coming out of African countries. But the problem that we have with agriculture is that it's all subsistence. So the average farmer is operating on you know, 0.2 or 0.3 of a hectare. Uh, interesting statistic I discovered the other day that Germany exports more coffee than the whole of the continent of Africa. And the last time I was in Germany, I didn't see any coffee farms. <laughs> but an even more alarming statistic is that the value of Swedish, uh, sorry, Swiss coffee. coffee exports is twice the value of German coffee exports. So again, you know, you can probably challenge the numbers, but I'm not going to be that far off. Uh, a kilogram of coffee costs about $3 at source. But actually, when you go into Starbucks and you, you buy that coffee, that kilogram uh, turns into something like $500 per kilo. Um, so th these are the issues which need to be addressed. Uh, you know, I have a friend, Andrew Rugasira, who uh, works out of Uganda and runs the Good African Coffee Company. And, and Andrew pays his coffee farmers more than fair trade pays them. Uh, he does the value addition, so he roasts and he packages and he exports and supports 14,000 14, Ugandan farmers. But you know, <laughs> That 14,000 Ugandan farmers, which sounds like a big number, if you take Andrew's annual turnover, it's only about $2.5 million. And so th that's where the investment needs to get into, in, in, into Africa. Uh, and so, you know, what are we doing about it as, as an industry? And I don't just speak on behalf of Safaricom, but I can give you, you know, the, the challenges facing, facing farmers are they don't have uh, access to decent weather information, they don't have access to pricing, they don't have access to... Uh, to, to capital, easy access to capital. Um, and, you know, farm extension services are worse now than they were maybe two, two decades ago. So they're not using the latest, the latest technology. So, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples, two or three examples of things that we're doing in, um, in <coughs> Safaricom specifically, but also in, in Africa. Uh, you know, there's a thing which we launched called ICAO, which is an information service for um, farming management. It's a tool which farmers use. And we launched it without any big advertising, We've probably got about 170,000 farmers who are now using that and are reporting up to 50% improvement in their yield. And a farmer could be a guy who has two cows, you know, it's not a big, a big deal. FarmForce, which is a cloud-based um, uh, mobile platform and keeps track of pesticide residue on, uh, on produce, which helps that farmer now to manage the quality of the, uh, quality of the goods coming out um, and actually makes him more attractive to the export market. We have a thing called Kilimo Salama, which is a scheme providing crop insurance, which helps to deal with the, the vicissitudes of, of life in, uh, in, in Africa and, uh, and the weather. And finally, M Farm, which enables farmers to market their crops effectively uh, by using, like, getting access to timely market information, because traditionally what a farmer would do is would just take whatever price is given to him at the market now he or she can decide what they want to do. So, you know, I've talked a little bit about agriculture. I haven't talked about uh, the impact that we're making on, on healthcare. And uh, here I have to commend GE because this has been a big focus for, for Jay and the guys. Uh, we haven't talked about how we're using a mobile phone to save, to save expectant mothers. You know, very high incidence of maternal mortality in Kenya and in Africa. The mobile phone, which is now so ubiquitous, is making an impact. We haven't talked about what we're doing on education. Again, you know, you can give a mobile phone to, uh, to a child and give him access to any piece of information in the world. That is such a huge leap from where 
of where he was yesterday, where he's on a, in a school without even cement on the floor. And we haven't talked, of course, about uh, M-Pesa because that's something which has probably been a bit, uh, bit overused. So, you know, what I'd say is that uh, coming into Africa, Africa has a lot of challenges, for sure. And, and uh, you know, the ease of doing business is not always uh, as we would expect it to be. However, what I'd say is for the intrepid, it's a fantastic place to be because innovation is driven by need. And because we have such massive needs, it forces us to be innovative to make, uh, to make our business work. Just one question, borders. Have borders become more cooperative in, 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 in your kind of line of business or are they? No, it's, I mean, it's shocking. Uh, you know, we, we talked about, uh, we talked about uh, uh, call rates from Kenya to, uh, to the US at five cents, but Kenya to Uganda at 28 cents. Uh, so these non-tariff barriers are, are really a, a, big, a big problem for us. We can't move money easily from Tanzania to Kenya or from Uganda to, to Rwanda. Uh, you know, those barriers are, are as big as ever. Thanks a lot. Um, Fernando, you've seen almost all the world and you're now based in Joburg. What's your perspective on, on all this? Thank you, Kamal. So I think in trying to think about this particular discussion, and I think you've all touched uh, to a certain extent on some of these topics. But what, what came to my mind, and it was really almost triggered, last week I was here in Washington, uh, we've been working with the White House um, on the Young Africa Leadership Initiative, and I had the privilege of actually hosting an event for all 500 Washington Fellows. And so this massive energy, right, this, this, the youth of Africa just came in the room and transformed the room. There was just activity, and they were through the expo. And, and, and we, I mean, I spent about six hours, and my team can attest, I didn't stop talking one-on-one -on -one to individuals for six hours, because their desire for information, their questions, the, 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 the initiative that they had was just completely overwhelming. But it's also refreshing, and I think it talks to the point of the inclusion of Africa, right, the 55 countries in Africa, are very, very unique because each one of these individuals, there was one individual from Eritrea, the single Washington fellow from Eritrea. And you know, he's so completely different from the rest of Africa because he lives in a very different world. And yet, first question to me, so can I get a computer with Microsoft software because I know my country's embargoed, but can we do something about this because I want to connect to the rest of the world, right? And so that, it's, it's such a simple to a certain extent because, and so when, when you refer to the borders, the, the trade situation between Africa, I think there's a statistic that says that potential trade in Africa, between Africa, so the east-west rather than the north-south trade, in a year is equivalent to the amount of aid that is actually delivered to Africa by well-intentioned multilateral and government organizations. And so the reality is Africa doesn't need the aid it needs to figure out how to get the trade amongst itself to start to work. And that is not trade between Africa. And I think that's, again, to take Bob's point, this is trade between independent, very diverse nations that need to learn to work together and break those barriers. So we have a view, and I'm going to illustrate this, I think, in thinking and asking you to think about slums. Think, think about the... the the phenomenon of slums, and slums are growing at an alarming rate around the world. There's about a billion people today that live or sl are slum dwellers. The forecast is that by 2050, three billion people, almost one third of the world's population, will be living in a slum. There's something interesting about a slum, there are many issues about slums, but there's something which is the people that live in a slum have no tenure in the land where they live. They don't belong to that land. They have no right to it. And so, typically in the more traditional world, business, education, healthcare is dispensed on the basis of your tenure and your location. You have a physical address, you show that you live in a community, and that community interacts with you or interacts with other communities. What we see, the promise of Africa, what we see Africa leapfrogging some of those legacies is that in the technology world, in the knowledge economy, in the digital world, call it what you will, I have an address. I'm Fernandes at Microsoft.com. I exist. Within that world, which by the way has no boundaries, 
right? I can present myself, I can trade, I can acquire information, I can educate myself or my children. And so that in itself we think and we see as the potential for Africa to leapfrog and for this trade to start to become something meaningful where the payment mechanisms are an enormously important part, but so is government policy. And I think the whole, there, there needs to be a focus which rather than, I appreciate that there's a, a discussion around democracy and there's a discussion around civil society, and those are all very important. But there also needs to be a dialogue with governments in Africa that refers to the policy of the digital age and the policy of allowing Africans across Africa to connect with the world, to be globally competitive, to participate in global economy purely through that little device that they carry in their hand with which they are so comfortable. Illiterate farmers are comfortable with the mobile phone. They understand how to use it. And so I think that's where the leapfrogging, I think, we believe is going to come from. And, and I think the last point on this is that what we're also seeing is the massive innovation and I think to the point, the problems that exist in Africa are very, very much relevant to Africa. My old boss, Bill, made a comment not so long ago. We were, we were having a discussion about something. And, and, and Gates made the comment about polio. And we were talking and he said, the cure for polio is not going to come from the Western world. Because the Western world doesn't need to invest resources figuring out the cure for polio because it is almost eradicated. Yet polio kills hundreds of thousands of children in Africa. So the cure to polio is going to come from Africa because it's the one continent where that need is so absolutely overwhelming. The cure for malaria will come from Africa because Africa needs it. And so that's, I think, as we see the opportunity for the development of Africa and the connection of Africa is going to be because Africans address their own problems in their own unique way, but the solution is so relevant to what they need that it makes it a really feasible solution. So the 750 million young people in Africa will participate in that market rather than perhaps a Western or Eastern or North European market because there is the potential for that market. We take a view that says Africa becoming a net producer of knowledge, of technology, is where Africa needs to go, I think, to break the boundaries of sometimes the physical challenges, mm -hmm. but also to, to create that almost unbelievable inclusiveness that these 55 countries need to figure out how to work on. And they're not there yet. I, I would argue that we are still far away from getting that. But it's possible. The technology exists. The innovation exists. The capacity exists. It needs to come together, I think, faster than it has up until now. Thank you very much, Fernando. I mean, on, on just you know, remembering the broad numbers, at the very beginning, after independence in many countries, there was a kind of positive period. Yes. And then there was a very tough period in the 80s. Or Civil early wars 90s. and liberation wars. And, and now everything. we've had the best years, the last 10, 12 years in, 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 in modern history, at least. So I, it, I would appreciate maybe later on also during the debate. Do you think this, this speed is kind of what one should expect or could it even accelerate a little bit more or um, you know, what are the key factors? Strive. Oh, thank, thank you. Um, you know, if you, if you go back to 1990, 91, when the work was going on that would lead to the telecoms revolution in Africa. If you had come to those of us who worked in the industry then and said to me, you know, what would it take for 70% of the African population to get a telephone? Uh, how much will it cost? Um, well, I would have said, look, it's greater than our GDP across Africa. And if you had said, look, to put a phone in everybody's hands, what, how will you do it? You probably would have called the police <laughs> to get you locked up somewhere. But it has happened. Some 700 million African people 
are connected. They have a cell phone. Uh, countries like Botswana, where we have a, a presence, have a penetration of 150%. Zimbabwe, 106%. I don't know where you are in Kenya, Bob. Nigeria, 70 plus percent. Uh, people are connected. You can, you can get a telephone if you want it. You can have 10 if you want. Um, and, and there are incredible lessons in that. But maybe if I can just draw on one of them. An extraordinary amount of capital was drawn into African telecommunications. The 90%, 99% of it is private capital. It required African entrepreneurs who pushed the regulatory environment, who pushed for policy changes, who took risks. In the early days, back in 94, there were very few multinationals taking a punt on Africa. Uh, the, it was local entrepreneurs fighting for spectrum, pushing to get uh, mobile phones in place. And then we got the, you know, people like Vodafone came in and partnered uh, with many African entrepreneurs. So you, you see the need for regulatory policy frameworks for the private sector to begin to come in. The capital is there. There's a wall of capital ready to build power stations, ready to build bridges and trains if you would trust the private sector in the same way. You could do that in agriculture and many other sectors. So the entrepreneurs came in and pushed, and pushed a transformation which has seen this extraordinary connectivity. Today we're no longer talking about connecting people. If you bring me a dozen cell phone licenses, I'm not really that keen to to pursue them. We are in a second revolution where we are beginning to use these platforms as enablers for healthcare, for agriculture, for banking services, financial inclusion, insurance, uh, education. This is, these are the frontiers, as Bob was talking earlier on, that we're beginning to push where the, this connected platform is now a, a means towards bringing more and more people, because it was a revolution of the ordinary man. I've always said that the telecoms revolution in Africa was not a communications revolution, ironically. It was a revolution that was spurred by billing when it became possible for someone in the slums to, get, to pay for their service, in the old system it was postpaid. You had, you had to know where you lived and your credit history and so forth. But when we became possible to get a prepaid SIM card, ironically, we already knew about radio communications and what you could do with that, but it was when we made it possible for ordinary people to buy access in an affordable, inclusive manner. And that's what we're beginning to do again with financial services, with uh, hopefully with education, insurance, agricultural extension. So this is the, the next phase of this revolution. And then they, there is a third beginning to push its way, which is the data revolution. The internet of things, as somebody has, has said, it will not leave Africa. From this data revolution, we are beginning now to see the footprint that will give people access to credit. Uh, imagine if you had to buy your car for cash, your house for cash, everything you ever bought for cash. A lot, of, a lot of people in the U.S. would find you'd have a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it is in Africa. This connectivity is going to create that next revolution, where it will become possible for ordinary people in the informal sector. They are not unemployed. 
If they were unemployed, there would be a revolution. A lot of people are employed in the formal sector. They work just like you and I. They may not have a pay slip, but they are feeding their families. Okay? And we need to make, to bring them into a greater inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Strive. As a follow-up question, that in terms of the education system, the skill system, is it accelerating? Is it kind of... I know some of these skills may not be that hard to acquire, others may be more difficult, but are you seeing, any of you really, are you seeing kind of the ed education and training system adjusting to the new technologies and any... I, I would say very much so. I, I think what we're seeing is the transformation of education away from the traditional classroom methods using textbooks. And I would actually reference a, a young group of young people in, in Kenya, they set up a little business called Kitabu, uh, the, the word for book. And what they're essentially doing is digitizing textbooks, putting them on thumb drives and making them available and transporting them so that children can have access. Um, we ourselves have an initiative called Teaching with Technology, where our focus is on the teachers and what we're seeing is the transformation. I was recently in Morocco and the conversation with the ministry was, and he re referenced it and he said, I have 65,000 problems. Those are my teachers, because my teachers need to move faster mm -hmm. than the pupils, and they are not. Because the, the, the young people are moving very fast because they're adopting the technology so much faster. As a government, we need to understand how we get our teachers to move at least as fast as the young people. So we're seeing transformation in skills for employability, so the more vocational oriented, the, the more um, creative, uh, certainly a, a huge focus on entrepreneurship skills. Um, and I think the formal sort of academic education is there, of course, and I think it will remain so, but I think there's a much broader perspective on the use and the adoption of technology around more socially active ways of creating, creating wealth. I think education and wealth creation are starting to run in parallel rather than as a formal serial process which perhaps worked 20 or 30 years ago. I think there's a massive leap. I mean, you know, start with a kid who's sitting in a, in a classroom that doesn't have cement on the floor and doesn't have a window, right? So that's your starting point. And then you move from bricks, uh, bricks to clicks, right? So suddenly you can deliver to this child the best quality of education, the best standard of education. You can bring uh, a lecturer from Zurich in the palm of the hands and deliver that information to here. And so that leap is happening now. I mean, one of the questions you asked earlier, you said you know, innovation around the world coming into Africa, but actually what we're finding now is that innovation in Africa is moving out to the rest of the world. I mean, the most obvious one is mobile money, mm -hmm. where we've made such a, a massive change mm -hmm. and we've driven the rest of the world in this area. And there's lots more coming out from places like iHub in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Nairobi. Nairobi. You've got iHub, you have iLab. You know, we've got a lot of these innovation hubs and those things are, are moving out of Africa and being exported to the rest of the world. I, I, I agree with all that, but on the other hand, I also see a lack of, of skills that we need from a standpoint of, I'll call it technical skills around engineering and things from universities. Um, and it's a combination. It's not like, it, it's two things. One is the, the, the need continues to grow pretty dramatically. And it's, it's to a degree magnified because many countries now have stringent localization requirements for you to be able to sell or invest in the country. So all of a sudden, um, you know, you have to go into a country and for every one expat, you need to have nine locals. And the problem is you don't, you, you know, that country may not be equipped yet to provide you those locals Numbers. from from an educational standpoint. Um, and so one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the World Bank uh, people have I've heard this quoted that that 11 percent of the college graduates graduate with degrees that are are usable in, in business and 70 percent are studying things that are not now I don't know where that comes from but I do know that the in many in many of the <clears throat> countries the technical skills engineering things like that are not at the same level as you know business skills law legal you know um, mm -hmm typical um, other, other studies. So, 
and there's plenty of great business people. <laughs> we need more engineers. You know, we need more of the young kids that are coming out, and, and that's going to be a key win. And I think that um, as many as there are graduating, just the need is, is multiplying faster than the, than the schools can graduate. So I think it's, it's up to com companies like ours and others to really invest in that. We've invested in some curriculum development ac ac across some of the countries uh, in some of the, ma the u major universities, uh, done internships, things like that to really drive that because it's really going to be the linchpin. And quite frankly, it's not that different in the U.S. either. But, you know, it's, it's a, almost a worldwide phenomenon yep. outside of Asia um, where we're not getting enough technical people, especially from the standpoint of what we need to do from engineering and things like that. But the, all of these issues that uh, Fernando and, and Bob talked about, those are the ones that are going to really hopefully bridge that gap as these kids continue to move you, on. You, you mentioned Asia, you know, and, and in the development literature there's quite a debate, of course. Asia did extremely well, I mean, overall, with some exceptions here and there over the last 30 years or so. But it did, it, a lot of that doing very well was really through manufacturing. I mean, it, you know, when you look at what happened in China and uh, in, in Korea before then and in, in some of the Southeast Asian nations, India less so. Um, and, and yet the, the share of manufacturing, you know, in global demand, global output is, is limited at the end of the day. And um, in, in terms of this, the, you know, the kind of dynamics in Africa, it's, it's probably not going to be a repeat of Asia. It's, it's something well, different is going to happen, I mean, right? I, I think Any I know thoughts on going. that? Yeah, I, I call it infrastructure. China, first time I went to China was 25 years ago. And, um, and at that time, everyone was worried about rule of law, mm -hmm. um, you know, the ability to protect your IP, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Security, the whole thing. And then in, in, in the 90s, in later in the 90s, I was in our plastics business, and we put a plant on Nan Sha Island, which was up the river from Hong Kong, instead of the mainland, because we wanted to ship by boat, because the mainland was a mess. There was no roads, there was no rail. And then one of the five-year plans in the late 90s, the Chinese said, we're going to do infrastructure. They built 100 airports. They built uh, all of the highways, the rail, and boom. That's what unlocked China, was the ability to move and make them manufacturing, and all that manufacturing could get out of the country. And Bob highlighted the issues you have. For us to put a, a manufacturing facility into a country in Africa that you can't get goods out of the port for two to three weeks, and then it takes however long to get delivered, or you can't make sure your, your goods get delivered to your customers. You don't have any security of electricity supply. That's, that's an inhibitor to investment around that. And until those things get fixed, it's going to be hard. Because I talked to a lot of heads of state. Well, we got cheap labor rates. We ought to be able to compete. And all that, all that ability is, is degraded by the, the infrastructure deficits that are there. And so as a result, Africa becomes one of the highest cost areas to manufacture anything. And I think that's a dynamic that's got to flip. And that's where infrastructure investment, I think, are going to really help out. I mean, I absolutely agree with, with Jay about the need for infrastructure. But I think there also needs to be a bit of a will. Uh, you know, again, I come back to my friend Mo this morning, who said that Africa has more mobile phones than America, but doesn't manufacture any. Mm -hmm. Actually, manufacturing doesn't seem to be a glamorous thing. And, um, and by and large, people don't want to move into manufacturing. But if you don't move into manufacturing, you're not going to create jobs. The opportunity for Africa to become the next factory of the world is absolutely there. Because China is beginning to come back to this whole China-America debate. China is doing two things. One is they are investing in infrastructure across Africa. And secondly, they're saying, if we can invest in infrastructure, then we can start to do manufacturing in China. And they've got uh, you know, very successful factories in Ethiopia, for example. Um, but I don't think there is a will. People don't look at manufacturing as being a glamorous thing to get into. Um, the, the big energy kind of investment is where governments tend to focus. But if we don't get into manufacturing, we ain't going to provide jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have any comments on the, the role of manufacturing in the future of Africa? Or, or is the whole question 
becoming kind of a wrong question. Is, is the line between manufacturing and software, you know, we, we all talk about the iPad example is a typical example. What, what kind of a product is this, you know? Is it the manufacturing product or is it really something quite different? I mean, from, from the old type of, even modern cars. When you look at how, what kind of cars are going to appear on the market 10, 15 years from now, a lot of the value added will be in the programming, in the, in the kind of soft, software of cars. I mean, there still be, will be, what do you call it? Steel bending? Metal bending. <laughs> Metal bending. But that whole part, of course, is becoming more and more important. So maybe there is some kind of leapfrogging possibility there too, that Africa will, will in some sense, do less steel bending than Asia did because the nature, the very nature of, of products and services in the world are, are changing. Well, look, I'm not in manufacturing and I would be wary to, to challenge uh, Ray, um, Jay on what he has to say from GE. But if he's moved from one billion to two and a half billion in, th in three years, Something must be going right in Africa for him. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good growth anywhere in the world. You know, so, you know, give us a break. We are working very hard to improve governance, to improve leadership, uh, to improve uh, infrastructure. These, some of these things take time. But I believe the fact that we are able now to buy power plants from GE and have options to also go to China to buy some of this stuff. We will begin to address some of these infrastructure deficiencies. Uh, there are policy issues that we have to address. Uh, the, you know, we, like, we are just like everybody else. We have issues to grapple with with education. I haven't come across any society where they say, we're all happy with our education system here. Uh, we have challenges. Uh, we have half of the world's children that are not in school are in Africa. The youngest population in the world is Africa. But we are not looking at this with despair. This is our hope, and we are going to turn this into our dividend for the future. These are no, great, on, yeah. You, sorry, let, let sure, me sure, jump back in again. Because you, you asked the question, it's a very good question. Um, you know, are we looking at just metal bending? It's not just about metal bending. You know, I was sitting next to uh, Coders Africa, uh, and you know, the, the guys there are saying, could we do coding in Africa sure. on behalf of? And so there, there's also you know, some, some intellectual stuff that we could right. be doing. Yeah. And you know, he, he's, got, he's sitting there. Um, you know, he's got tons of, there he is, he's got tons of people. I don't know the number, you, you told me a moment ago. Tons of people who could be doing this kind of stuff, which currently is being done in Asia. And it could very, very effectively yeah. come into Africa. To that so point. it's not just right. about metal bending. No, right, yeah, and I look, what we're looking at is trying to take some of the engineering graduates that are coming out. Mm -hmm. And why can't we do, you know, it's kind of the old drafting and the, the basic levels of design, uh, do it where you do things there. And, and we're looking mm -hmm. at that in Ethiopia and a couple of other countries. And I don't want Strive to think we're not, but we are investing, uh, we're, we're, we announced today we're going to invest about two and a half billion dollars of our money into Africa and across localization uh, assembly facilities in manufacturing. So we are doing Good. it, but, um, but it, uh, over the next five years. And um, as also skills building. So it's, you know, we're very optimistic in that. And I think it's just a question of, again, keeping up with the growth, because that's really the dynamics that's, it, what, that's great about Africa. I think we'll, Fernando, you wanna I, I, I just wanted yeah. to come back to that. I think sometimes we, when we look at China or India or Brazil, I think we need to be very careful not to make this comparison directly. And I think, Jay, to your point around infrastructure. You know, when China put a five-year plan to build infrastructure, it was one government building infrastructure okay. in one country. And it was measured on the relative success of itself versus itself. In Africa, we have such a variety of success and you know, benchmarking because some countries in Africa have better governance than others. Some countries have better infrastructure than others. Some countries actually achieve levels of success. The challenge is that everybody's investing in Africa. 
Okay, let's invest in a country in Africa and enable that country to build its infrastructure. I would bet you that that country would surpass China very quickly. But no, because we see this billion and a half or billion whatever people, we invest in Africa. And so it's almost like spreading peanut butter. And we're trying to be very democratic with our investments. Just put a big lump of peanut butter in the middle and let it go. Perhaps that would create a, a different scenario. Well, I think there, there are some questions from the floor, right? Yes, I will. Um, Miriam, why don't you start? We, we haven't mentioned trade, so I'm sure you will say something about trade. Miriam was the deputy trade representative at, in the US, and we're lucky to have her. Yes. Thank you. Miriam Sapiro from Brookings. Uh, this morning, Mo made an impassioned plea uh, for a single economic uh, entity in Africa. And each of you have operated uh, companies across borders. So, and I think even um, Fernando and um, uh, Bob mentioned some of the challenges with tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers. Um, so maybe this is the jelly approach instead of the peanut butter. But my question is, um, given the variety of regional organizations, regional economic organizations that are growing in Africa right now, do you think there is the possibility of much more unity in the economic uh, trade investment sphere? And if so, um, where do you see uh, the potential success coming from? I mean, not to have ECOWAS compete with EAC or any of the other uh, growing organizations, but what's your sense from being on the ground as to which would be the most promising and potentially most useful? Anyone who, yes, Fernando? No, I was going to oh. Jay probably oh. Jay have a bigger Well, comment. look, I think the, you know, the aspect of regionalization is absolutely going to be key to growth. And to the point that we've heard, it is 55 countries. And there's no way that Microsoft or GE is going to put in 55 Microsofts or GEs. And we need right. to, if you will, regionalize. So if you take East Africa as an example, you know, if you, if you have Kenya at 40 to 50 million people, Ethiopia at 80, Tanzania at 40 to 50. But if you put them all together with Rwanda and Burundi, you've got 200, and Uganda, 200 and some odd million people, maybe more. And that's, those are the, and all of a sudden you have scale. Now, the ability then to do something that you can then serve those countries, that's, that's where you're going to, I think, see a lot, a lot of potential from that standpoint. I think you have, you know, there are ECOWAS, EAC, SADC, COMES, they've all got different things that are positives. Um, and it seems, so right now, it seems like the EAC is probably the furthest ahead. Uh, they are doing things around on the borders, at least physical borders, not necessarily the tariffs. But, um, but I mean, it's starting to happen. But it takes, it's a tough road because every country you go in wants to be. I've been, I've been into five countries in the last six months in West Africa, and everyone has told me that they're going to be the main supplier to the West Africa power pool, and everyone else is going to offtake from them or the gas pipeline. And those are the things that it's got to be, the, the little countries have got to have some kind of uh, wins as well as the big guys. And I think that's the balance. It's an interesting dynamic on, on we've talked about inter-Africa trade and stuff. We, we, earlier this morning at a, at a thing we had, Aliko Dangote, Nigerian, he says, with the exception of ECOWAS, he needs 36 visas to travel around Africa. He goes, Americans can go typically and get visas at the airport. He said, so he mm -hmm. said it's not even equal within Africa. So those are the kind of things that are, that are things that I think can be broken down a little bit from a standpoint and, and really encourage this inner Africa trade. There was a question there, yeah? With the lights, I can't really see over there. So somebody has to help me. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Rob Colarina, AIC Investment. Um, I think, Fernando, your comment about sort of the, uh, the, uh, the energy of the entrepreneurs was interesting. Um, if you could take it further and, and perhaps Stray, you know, comment a little bit as well. How do you take the, uh, the entrepreneurs into sort of the disruptive uh, type of class in terms of those that are going to be scalable, those that are going to be investable? I mean, the, the prior panel talked about private equity and venture capital. But that is, you know, that is a smaller funnel. 
um, I'd be curious as to their dynamics to, uh, to that competitive advantage. So it, it's an interesting question because I think there is the balance between the risk of investing in Africa because of the nature of the African risk or the risk of investing in a technology startup or a manufacturing plant, which is essentially equal anywhere across the world, and those risk assessments get done more on the basis of what is it that you're investing in, what is the infrastructure availability, what is the policy, and so on. And I think perhaps there is a very high tendency towards thinking of investing in Africa being risky because of Africa. And perhaps I think if we start to change that a little bit and start to move the the needle towards understanding that the basic premise is a business investment or a infrastructure investment, then I think perhaps it will change the conversation between the potential entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurs on the ground and those that have money to invest or are looking to create growth. Because if we look at it from the growth perspective, I think we would all agree this is paradise. The growth rates in Africa are huge. I mean, it, it has been sustained for quite a period of time. So I think sometimes the paradigm with which people look at investment is, is something that we need to worry about. The second point, just to close, is the nature of the investment. And there's a very big gap between seed capital and angel investment and then the venture capital and the institutional investment. And that gap needs to be bridged. And there's, I think, an opportunity with the African diaspora. Um, there's an opportunity with looking at ways of, br of bridging that gap and putting some you know, a venture capital fund or investment of $5 million is very difficult for most African startups to consume. The, there isn't the liquidity and there isn't the size in the market. But if that's the U.S. standard, it's, it's, it, there's a mismatch. And so we need to probably look further down and, and understand that. Well, I think that's changing. I mean, I spend a lot of time speaking to international investors, uh, particularly here in the U.S., and, um, you know, the success stories are speaking for themselves. And Strife is a very successful business. Uh, running out of Zimbabwe. We, we are running a very successful business. If you'd invested in my company two years ago, it was worth about $1.6 billion. Uh, today it's worth $6 billion two, two years later. So Correct. the success stories we need to talk about, and investors are happy to come. You know, we, my shares are heavily oversubscribed. And people are, people are going past that African risk thing. I mean, yeah, it's a bit definitely. yesterday's story. Thank you. You know, we are active in some 17 African countries. 17. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have people, we have offices, we have boots on the ground. We're Africans. We don't see a lot of these problems. Maybe um, that's not to say they're not there. But I think the way to we look at it is, because, is it easier for me to invest in Nigeria than Russia? Nigeria any day. Any day of the week. <laughs> You know, and it's a perspective. It's a perspective on risk. It's a perspective on the issues. We're long term. So I'm not concerned about currency in Burundi or the CFA in Ivory Coast because we are there as Africans for the good. Regional integration, it's happening. Not because the politicians, because Africans are beginning to invest with Africans. Today I see more Nigerians in, in Johannesburg and in Lome doing business than my fathers could ever have dreamed of. True. And it's Africans. And that's what will drive the policy changes. Uh, so if you want to do business in Africa, find African partners and work with Africans. I think that probably works in Brazil too, but I'm only talking about <laughs> Africa. <laughs> yeah, there's a hand up. There's more over here. But yeah, I can't, can't see, see them, anything. unfortunately. You, you have a bias. Yeah, you, you have, have a, a left hand bias. I, I definitely have a bias. And looking right there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, well since I'm up, so I'm somebody take, has to help. I'm going to take the opportunity. Fernando, maybe you can help. <laughs> Anyway, okay, that's the last I'm going to go from <laughs> okay. to that direction. My, my name is Leroy Wilson, Jr. I'm an attorney from New Rochelle and Botswana. I think that it seems to me that one of the reasons that the, that the perception of Americans into Africa, and that is the entire continent, is so skewed is because the, our media doesn't really cover Africa on a fair basis. And so the question is, is there anything that one can do about that? And if so, what? 
Okay. Maybe we'll collect two or three questions and then, and yeah, and you, in the meantime. So I've, oh yeah, can you help me there? But there's yeah, a vent to right, right in the middle here. Right. All right. Hello, I'm Mark Johnson uh, from Astra Capital Management. We're an emerging technology investor in both the communication space and in growth companies in America with international aspirations. And I, I, I see there's a lot of partnership between large businesses and sort of countries and entrepreneurs on the ground in Africa. But could you speak a bit about the opportunity for growth companies with great ideas, particularly in the communication space, that might be more ready partners for Mpesa or Strive and different businesses in Africa that they could kind of partnership with and help facilitate growth in the communications world? Maybe we'll take those two, the, the media question and, and this one. So, um, very vibrant market. I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Mcopa. Mcopa is, um, is a, <laughs> one of my favorite products. And it's a simple product, right? So, we work with a very small company, a couple of guys, Jesse Moore and uh, Nick Hughes. They came together and they developed a product which has uh, a, a solar panel, it has some LED lights, it has a lithium ba battery, and it has M-Pesa and a SIM card. And now what we're delivering is we're delivering uh, renewable energy right to the grassroots at an affordable rate of about 40 or 50 cents per day. And uh, there was a guy who, you know, when they first came to me and I said, you know, do you want to scale up? How much money do you need from us? And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm good. And he was, it was very easy for him to find the funding. And there are lots more of those companies around. Um, you know, the startup companies, the IT companies, working with the big partners like us, uh, and also with, with GE, you know, GE had the, first of all, you know, had the confidence of coming into, um, into, into, onto the continent and investing and putting senior guys like, like Jay to do it, but, you know, he knows that he can't do it on his own, so he's working with lots of, you know, people like Seven Seas Technology, for example, so lots of smaller companies, and um, the opportunity is there. The media thing, uh, maybe... <laughs> You're American, you're in the US. <laughs> also used to be in the media business. Um, the me I think it's a question of really understanding, understanding Africa and having people, you know, when people come and, vi and come, they, they see what it's like, it's, it's a perception. Some people think it's all, you know, grass huts and others think it's nothing but big cities. Um, no one understands the this, this size People ask about, you know, they, I've been questioned, what about, has Boko Haram impacted your business in Lagos? I said, that's the same, Boko Haram's in Maine and Lagos is New York City. Maybe even further south, I don't know, yeah, yeah, maybe New Jersey or Maryland. I said, that, that's the dynamic, and they go, oh, really, yeah. I go, oh, yeah, it's, there's very, it's, uh, you know, and that's the issue, it's, it, and everyone that comes and visits, and we, Typically, we'll tip, they'll go to Lagos and then they come to Nairobi. They get on the Lagos to Nairobi flight, which is five hours. They go, Jesus, this is like flying across America. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, no kidding. It's a long way between these countries. And so what happens in one doesn't mean it happens in the other. And I think it's, it, you know, Bob talked about his company and the, the success stories. There's an unbelievable amount of success in companies, uh, in people, mm -hmm. in um, you know, in innovation that's, ha that's occurred, and that doesn't necessarily get, get selected for stories. I think hopefully this week it will. Maybe that'll change some of the perceptions mm -hmm. by some of the media. You've already seen some of them in the, pre -pr the, the press pre-event uh, over the weekend and stuff where they're focusing on the positives. And so hopefully, and we, we try to help. I travel back here quite a bit, and my sole goal is to change the perception of investing in Africa. But I think, you know, Jay, we have to take people into Africa. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, Strife was, was, was sharing with us his, his thoughts about taking Americans into Africa to show them what it looks like. To come to Washington to talk about Africa yeah. actually doesn't make a lot of sense. So. Uh, um, and if you look at, uh, I don't name the media houses, but, you know, they don't have many much in the way of local bureaus in, mm -hmm. in no, Africa. No, they don't. And so that will never change it, unless they come into the continent. Add one, we were talking with Strife. Strife, go ahead first. You know, I was just going to say, look, on the media side, for us as Africans, we are perhaps at the moment more concerned about Africans developing their media and talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, things like we're, we're more excited about what's happening with social media. Yes. 
the interaction amongst Africans, amongst our young people, uh, to, to one another. Look, I can't speak for what people write in China or America about Africans. And I guess if you came to an African newspaper, you might think the same about what they write about America. So, you know, that's the world we live in. And I'm not going to prescribe to somebody what they observe or not observe. Uh, we get onto very dangerous territory. Uh, I think what is important now is that you have a very confident Africa beginning to talk about Africa and energetic youth communicating about their lives with or without the international media. Well, Strive and I, we were talking before the meeting, and I just want to add that dimension, which I've observed, you know, I've been all over the world and working on many economies around the world and many societies, but there's one thing that strikes me, and I wonder whether, you know, you would agree with that, is the pragmatism and the forward-lookingness of African elites, business, young people, and so on. And, you know, I mean, I don't want to say anything negative about anybody, but there are places in the world now who are justifying current battles and killing by referring 1,400 or 1,200 or 800 years back. And, you know, some of them in the Balkans were like that, you know. So, whereas in Africa, there are problems, of course, ethnic tensions and there are all kinds of t tensions, but it seems to me that it's a very future-oriented culture. Is, is, is that correct? Well, I wouldn't call it a culture. I, I mean, or, or, far, or a pro approach to life, let's say. You know, but um, I've seen an index which says that the happiest people in the world right now are Nigerians. <laughs> so, well, that's um, Carol Graham from Brookings. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, um, the, there is an energy in Africa today. Um, the, there is, if, you, if you go into, into the bars and the coffee shops, wherever you are, uh, young people are, there are more young people discussing about the future and the things they are doing and want to do. And that you only have to go, you know, I asked one of our people once about the growth of our, of our data consumption. Uh, as Bob will probably attest with me, broadband is the fastest growing part of our businesses. And I said, you know, what are they doing with the data? And came back a report in front of me which said 60% is social media. Okay, they are interacting and talking and sharing ideas. Uh, that's not to say we are not confronted with all the other challenges. And, and the, we, we have to deal with all the issues of, um, of terrorism just like everybody else. And, uh, the challenges of leadership and corruption and many other um, aspects. But yes, there is a greater sense of energy and the future coming out of Africa. And it's a good thing for the world mm -hmm. because half the world's youth will be living in Africa over the next 25 years. And there's, you know, it's a great feeling to feel that their youth are busy. <laughs> so. Uh, but I think we have to invest in this youth, and uh, Jay is right to talk about skills. But we also have to think that the skills may not be the skills of the past. We, we, we want to learn about China. We are observing China and Brazil and everything else, but we are not China and we are not Brazil. We are Africa. We will go our way, but we will learn the good things that other people have. Because 20 years ago, everybody was saying, what about Japan? Uh, and before that, they said, what about the miracle of Western Europe after the war and so forth? And we can go on and on about this. But we will learn the good things. As a good friend of mine likes to say, eat the meat and throw away the bones. So we will pick up what's good. And we will try and learn those lessons uh, and, uh, and take our people forward. Fernando, yeah. So perhaps on this point, just the testimony of the, the recent um, Young Africa Leadership Initiative where the US was looking to invest in 500 young people 
and received more than 50,000 applications across Africa. 50,000 young people in Africa believe inherently that they are a leader, that they are a future leader and they will have a future impact on the continent. I think that, and that has essentially resulted in the government, the White House, USAID, has gone out and raised more investment more for Africa as a result of those 50,000 people on the continent. I think that that's, that's that energy that you right. feel. I think, I think the strength, I mean, I think the, the biggest resource of Africa is its people mm -hmm. because it's, it, the, the optimism, the continued perseverance, the patience and really getting things done has been unbelievable. And I can tell you for me personally, uh, in my office in Nairobi, we, you know, this is kind of an anecdote, but uh, we threw a 60s costume party for Christmas and all these all these people, all the office guys came and they all had, I would say, most of the stuff came from their parents' closet that they were <laughs> wearing. So the next day I said so, or ne Monday I said so, <clears throat> pulled everybody together, wished them well for Christmas, etc. I said, so how many of you people were born in the 60s? Two. One of them was me. <laughs> I was, and then one of them was my CFO who was born in December of 69. And so I go into work and I'm with these young dynamic, I mean the whole office is that way. Our average age is, you know, in maybe 29, 30. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't find that in when I go to Schenectady or Fairfield or any of the other locations we have. GE's been around a long time. Um, and, you know, they all look at me and they can't believe I worked at GE for 34 years because I'm mm -hmm. 10 years older than they've been alive. Yeah. Or ten years and longer in GE than they've been alive. But I think there's the so it's kind of fun. there's the additional point that these young people are thinking about 2020, 2025, oh, yeah, and, and so. not about 1500. Or they know what they see, what they can get to. They can they they're using to Strive's point, social media, etc. They're excited. They do whatever. Yeah. It's really great. We have one question from Twitter, kind of on governance, but maybe we'll take one more from somewhere where I can't see. Okay, the lady here, maybe I, I can't see. And then we'll have to close. And the, and, and the Twitter question is really the quality of governance. Do we see an improvement, less corruption, less, you know, more transparency? I mean, you know, we have problems with that all over the place in the world, but any comments on that? But yes. Thank you. My name is Kate Thompson. I'm from Deloitte. And for all the reasons that all of us in the room and you on the panel know, um, I personally believe that until we see women as a fully productive members of the real economy and governance and social change agents and social media and civil society, we won't really see that transformation that we've been talking about across the continent. So I guess a question for you and your organizations and your sectors, what are you doing and what are you seeing happening to bring women and girls into your sectors and into your organizations as really on equal footing to men and boys? Thank you. All right, so those are the two questions, the governance and the very important question of the role of women in Africa. Okay, so let me have a go first. Okay. Um, because governance is still a challenge. And it was nice to hear Mo Ibrahim said this morning that he was seeing an improvement over the past 10 years, but it's still not good enough. It still has a long way to go. And it takes big companies like us. You know, if we're not doing something about it, nothing is going to get done. And, you know, we're doing quite a lot of work. To, to do that. I sit on the UN Global Compact Board and driving ethics and um, integrity across business across the continent. And women are a very good idea, a you know, very good question, right? So, uh, you know, I have some of the brightest women working in my company, uh, and I say that without hesitation. Uh, and they're not even watching because they're probably in bed now, back in, in Nairobi, so I'm not saying it for their benefit. Uh, but uh, something like 36% of my exco are women. I spend more on developing the level below that than I spend on on, on men. I have a crash in the office because women have to deal with this whole double shift stuff. But we're going beyond that. So we're going right back into the primary schools and explaining to children, bringing them into the workplace to show them what can be done. And why is that important? You know, I, I, next door to me is, um, is a bank, it's a, it's a big bank, international bank. And I, I take Jeremy to my office and I say, Jeremy, you look at my workplace and you look at your workplace. And if you're hiring an accountant, 
who do you think she would work for if you paid the same salary? She'd work for me because I have a more conducive environment. And because we work children right away from the primary school, right away through secondary into university, and we bring them in, not because we necessarily want to hire them, but because we want to create a larger pool of women. And African women are some of the smartest and the most fearsome women, I have to tell you. Some of the most <laughs> fearsome women that I've had to, I've had to work with. Uh, and it makes my company a much better company uh, to, work, to work in and to, to serve our customers. You know, I, um, I as, you early, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, I, um, I chair the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which is an organization promoting agricultural uh, uh, development and food security through smallholder farmers. So here are the statistics. Over 70% of the food grown in Africa, eaten in Africa, is produced by women. So the African farmer is a woman. She doesn't own the land that she's farming. Um, and she's poor, and she's getting older. Uh, if we are to replace her with her daughter, her daughter is smart, she's not gonna go onto that land and do it. And do it. Uh, and her son is, is not on the land either. So how we address this, how we empower women, uh, how we give them access to, to credit, ownership to land, these are the heavy lifting items that need to be addressed by this crop of African leaders. We have made strides on governance. When Nelson Mandela came out of prison, only five or six African countries were having regular elections. Today, less than five or six African countries are having regular elections, and the debate has moved on to the quality of the elections and the quality of the governance. This is important. Uh, the next generation of African leaders is alive to these issues, and we will, we will continue to push to try and address uh, the, the governance issues. So it's not something we're gonna hide under the table. And of course, uh, you, you, will, you will not be able to, you know, just like with Asia, there's a difference between Myanmar and Singapore. Remember, as we have talked around here, that those who know Africa know that it's 55 sovereign countries. So you're going to see a differential uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the pace, and uh, those of you who, who are keenly interested in Africa will appreciate that we're not going to be able to clear all the issues. But uh, one thing we can be optimistic about is that the African woman is, is resilient, and she's very clear that she's not going to allow us the young men to occupy this space. Speaking for myself, I, I run an organization in which the majority of my top management, over 60% are women. Thank you very much. I like the way he said, us the young us, men. Us the young men, yeah, I noticed that too. I know, that. I know, well, that's good, that's good, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Perhaps I would offer one other comment, which is the ability to look at best practices and take role models and learn from those is something that I think hinders, especially when it comes to gender equality, because I think when we look around the world, there's probably woefully very few countries, regions. Um, you know, Asia has been very successful economically, but I think we could argue about the rights of women or the ability for women to be equal partners in those economic developments. Latin America probably suffers from the same, and perhaps even the United States still has a way to go, depending on which state in the union you want to look at. And so again, I will come back to the strength, the resilience, and the capability of African women. They'll figure it out because they know how. Um, and I think we, as perhaps multinational organizations, yeah, sure, we, we apply corporate American standards, we apply gender equality, we apply diversity rules, we apply governance and transparency business rules, of course, we do that, and we are very consistent in how we apply them across every single government that we deal with. So that's important because that level of consistency must remain in place. But I think that when it comes to gender equality, I agree with you. Let the women in Africa, they, 
they won't let us get away with it. But, but they can't. I mean, so you make a good point about, uh, about American. Fortune 500 companies, the number of women who are sitting on boards, who are CEOs, who are chairmen, uh, you know, it's shockingly low. And that's not a benchmark that no, in, not, in right. Africa we should right. be following. No. We need to give, you need to give access, as Bob said, and you know, have programs, et cetera, and, and role model. All the things you guys have said is absolutely key. On the, on the governance thing, um, you know, we operate in about 160 countries around the world, and corruption is not an African issue, or bad governance is not an African issue. It's, it's more global. And I think it's a combination of number, and it takes two. And so you know, everybody thinks it's always, you know, you say no, you don't do that, you know, then people understand that. We're fortunate, we're a big company that we can do that. I think it's very hard on, um, on smaller entrepreneurs that are trying to get through the system, if you will, the bureau bureaucracy where the, a lot of that might occur. But what I have found is that fundamentally it's if you work the, work the process, push, but don't try to get overly aggressive from a standpoint of speed. If you're, because once you try to push the process faster than it really wants to go, then you're opening yourself up. And I think that's the, and so there's this balance. And I think the good news from our company's standpoint is, you know, there's no order or sale or anything that's worth saying yes to a bad thing. Um, it, it's no is, and you've got to train people continuously. But it's, and you have to understand local customs and, and all as, as well, but, um, you know, I think, as more people get through, and I think the one thing I've seen in Africa, the press now is, the press is really getting focused on at least government tenders and things like that. So that's always helpful as well. But I, it's improving, it's got a ways to go, as Bob said, but you know, we're continuing to see an improvement on that. Well, Jay, Bob, Fernando, Strive, thank you so much on behalf of the whole audience here. A round of applause to our panel.